Hello and welcome to this installment of The Poet's Voice. I'm Julianne Russo and I will be your host. And joining me again today as our guest host is Canadian author Bruce Meyer. Thanks for joining us today, Bruce. Glad to be here. Thank you. Also joining us today is Antonia Fasciponti. She is an MA candidate in English in the field of creating creative writing at the University of Toronto. And she was recently awarded a Canadian Graduate Scholarship from the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council. Her poetry has been published in various prominent literary magazines, and she was shortlisted in 2020 for Exile, the Literary Quarterly's Gwendolyn McEwen Poetry Competition for Emerging Writers. Uh, she joins us today and is launching her first book this spring called To Make a Bridge. Thanks for joining us, Antonia. Thanks for having me. Okay, Good, so um, I'll let you take it away from here, Bruce. I, I had the pleasure of, uh, of, of being Antonia's uh, professor at the University of Toronto in uh, several creative writing courses, uh, several poetry courses and so forth. And she uh, really showed a tremendous amount of, of promise. And, um, you know, um, I suppose, you know, just, just down to earth talent, you know? And uh, so um, it, it's a pleasure for me to see uh, her new book, uh, To Make a Bridge, come out. Um, uh, so it, uh, and I had a hand in, in editing it, but she wrote it all. I didn't change a word. So, um, in any case, it's appearing from Black Moss uh, shortly, and um, I certainly highly recommend it to everybody. Um, uh, I guess the first question I have for Antonio is, did the manuscript you uh, envision compare to the uh to the final how did, how did it compare to the final book the manuscript that you had in your head when you started out because i mean i remember you giving me you know a stack of poems and uh and i said to marty you know this marty gervais the publisher this would make a great book um uh, but the, the what was there was a great stack of poems you know uh but how did it how did the the stack of poems compare to the net result so yeah, that's a really good question. Um, and I have a copy of the book here just to show what it looks like, what the cover and everything looks like. But it was definitely um, very different than I imagined. I I think that as a young author, I thought at first, my first book would be um, just this perfect replica of what I had in my head. And it was completely different. Um, for one thing, we cut several pieces that I originally had in the in the book a few short stories, a few poems, um, and at first I had thought those were totally integral to the book, and now um, those are a whole other book. You know, those are for another day. Um, and then another another thing about the the book that I never would have expected, um, you helped me see the the opera structure in it, which was absolutely magnificent. I had them, I had the poems organized in this huge mess like they were just kind of all over the place and then you had showed me how to put them into the structure with an overture and a first movement and an intermezzo a second movement and a finale and that really helped me see new resonances between the poems um like for example the overture poem you know seeing that kind of as a model for the rest of the book and things like that just really helped bring it all together you know, books are all it, putting a book together is almost like scoring, um, scoring like a motion picture score, or putting together a symphony or something like that. And um, I think the rule number one is to make sure that the, the that the editor is listening to what the poems are trying to say, yeah. um, and uh, some of them are, are talking in this direction, and some of them are talking in a completely opposite direction. So I'm glad you saw that. Um, the, the middle poem, the poem that lands almost dead center in the book, yeah. is beautiful. It's a, it's a poem called Intermezzo. Uh, would you be interested in reading that? Yes, that sounds lovely. I'm just going to take a sip of water first. Okay. Mm. Here we go, okay. Intermezzo. Between arugula greens and aromatic espresso, 
the fruit platter signals a spell of cleansing. Between lusty crimson strawberries, lush cantaloupe flesh fennel slices, crisp aqueous crescents with licorice hints that blot vinegar stains on my tongue. Crunching, I chronicle school shenanigans. Zeos and Zias listen up, swaying their own children from neon wrapped candies. Nonna rinses sugo off dinner plates, an adagio. Water sloshes, swirls round the bowl, mixing with cold tomato leftovers. Pulpy red specks whirlpool through the drain. Nonno takes a space at the table's edge, slicing a peach. Dismembered chunks plop into his glass of vino, a speechless ballad. He will retrieve the fruit with his knife, yield the pit to the crumb-dusted tablecloth. One of the grandchildren will spot the peach fiber and perhaps gnaw at the remains. Beautiful. And I love the sensuality of the poem. Um, I, I love the, 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 the detail of cleaning the dishes and just, yeah. you know, and, 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 and also just the beauty uh, of, the, of the whole family together uh, and so forth. And the key word I think that I, I picked up on uh, there was the word between in, in the opening part because an intermezzo is between acts, you know, and, mm -hmm. uh, and of course, you, you've got this betweenness of, of the, uh, the you, you talk about the, 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 the experience, say, uh, at Italy and the experience in Canada, and it's almost as if you're in between, you know, uh, but you're paying attention to all the details. Um, I guess this leads to the next question. What are your favorite subjects to write about? Yeah. That's actually a really good segue. Um, I really like writing about the little everyday things that you would never expect to find a poem in at first glance. Um, so in that poem specifically, an in intermezzo, it would be things like slicing a peach or, um, you know, rinsing dishes after dinner. Um, because these things seem to really pass us by if you don't if you don't pay attention to them. And then when you give them a little more attention and a little more thought, you find not only poetry in them, but a human connection that you didn't think existed. Um, to that end, you've got a wonder, lovely poem about uh, it's called uh, titled uh, Sitting on the Couch with Nono. Um, and it's, it's, I can remember sitting on the couch, you know, with, with my grandparents, you know, and, uh, just, just being next to them, whether they were reading to me or whatever. Um, would you care to, would, would you, would you, would you be willing to read sitting on the couch with Nono? Yeah, for sure. I really like that one too. So. my body curling like a fiddlehead into his stomach. He pets my head with a warm hand, names me nourishment. Don't let your mouth boast by branding him a hunter that collects the future to cook up and boil down. He is my shade, my ombra, keeping me cool from suns that wither plants as I grow further and further into myself. It's very, it, it's delicate, and there's this, there's this sense that you're, 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 you're growing into yourself, but you're growing almost out of, out of him, you know. And also, there's the sense, sense of, um, I suppose, all this sort of, uh, there's something feeding it all, you know. And uh, um, I was going to ask you about um, what do you value most about about you, you know the, the culture that you you bring to these poems you know the background and the history and so forth yeah yeah um ooh, what do i value most i really value um and this is gonna i guess contradict a little bit the poem that i just just read but i really value the way that um italians can laugh at themselves about a lot of things you know there's always something to joke about and there's always you know, funny story to tell. And um, 
But at the same time, like you saw in, in this poem, sitting on the couch with Nono, they're also very tender and um, silent moments that are, are very warming and heartfelt. Because I mean, there's this, that there's that sense of almost um, so, something buoying everybody up in the book. Mm -hmm. um, you know, no, nobody has an easy time, but they they seem to have have a resilient time, and um, that there, there's that sense of resilience. Um, the, the things that were cut out, do you think they'll? Do you think you'll pick up on that theme of resilience in the future? Yeah, um, definitely. I. Um... I think that some of the ones that were cut out actually very directly related to, like you said, this idea of resilience and hard work and things like that. Um, I actually have been kind of just keeping them on the back burner for my um, second year project at U of T with it for my MA, um, because in my second year, I have to write a, a manuscript for it. Um, and, and I also just put it on the back burner, kind of meditate on it a little bit. So I didn't fall into the same um, thematic patterns as to make a bridge because I didn't want it to be, you know, just the same thing again or anything like that. Because th throughout the book, you um, you have a couple of poems that are translations of other people's poems. Um, I think there's one by Gianna Petrarca. Uh, mm -hmm. There's one by uh, Giovanni uh, Riccio. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, did did you see that those 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 writers as being inspirations to you? Um, did they were they guides to you in some way? Definitely, yeah. Um, they were definitely guides. I think that the um, the generation of Italian Canadian writers before me, you really get a much more um, immediate sense of their experience of immigration or. Um, like the hardship or the discrimination they might have faced when they came here. Um, but, but that's not something I have experienced personally. So when I was engaging with these writers, writing the translations of their pieces, um, I, I was really trying to emphasize the mediated quality, the, the idea that it's a translation. It's, it's a third generation Italian Canadian writing about it. Um, writing it like from the perspective of the grandchild who who has a much more tender relationship to their grandparents than than what the grandparents might have had to the, the world when they came here because there, there's this sense throughout the book and I, and I think it was something that caught my eye that that you know we, we've we've left the place we had and we're having a hard time adapting to the place where we are but hey let's eat you know <laughs> yeah <laughs> there was this there's this tremendous celebration of food and so forth um, that seems to sort of almost make up for the diaspora, for the the uh, the, the, the scattering and so forth. Um, uh, what have you, I mean, what do you think they learned in terms of their personal journey? Mm, that's a good question. Um... I feel like, hmm, that's a really good question. Because you come yeah. back to it in a poem uh, such as to Renata, mm -hmm. and then these uh, almost like letters going back and forth. Mm -hmm. um, it, could you could, maybe maybe read read Renata and and it'll sure. the thing I'm trying to point out. Well, well, I think yeah. I hope will come clear to the listeners. So that's a good idea. Okay. Dear Renata, I live with prayers tucked in the shallow drawer of my coffee table, letters shoved in aluminum pots. I've littered my soul with words. Crumpled, ink-slopped papers have become my obsession and I scratch in the back of Mama's recipe book. Giuseppe says he's fine with the habit so long as it don't interfere with my job at the shoe store or the cooking. Yesterday, I found a page stuffed in the heart of a radicchio. Here's what it said. Green pears ballooning, pregnant with sweet juice, ready to plop into soil, rot and birth seeds. I'm still searching for grace, a virtuous string of words. 
love Zada. That's lovely. There, there's, there's this. I think there's that. What, what was something else that caught my eye was you, you noticed furniture a great mm -hmm. deal in the yeah. book, but it's not just the fact that there's things in a room, but the things have personal meaning, like the 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 the, 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 the drawer in the coffee table and so forth, and the the things scratched in the back of the uh, of the book uh, and so forth. Um, you you also talk about the cabinet of fame. Mm -hmm. Expand upon the cabinet of fame. Yeah, um, for sure. The cabinet of fame is um, a reference to the medieval poem, The House of Fame by Geoffrey Chaucer. Yeah. Um, and in, in the poem that Chaucer wrote, there's, you know, this big structure called the House of Fame, and it's where all these stories kind of travel to um, through the air. And what I really want to emphasize was this idea that there's this precious space where um, all the important things are kept. So that's kind of what I tried to um, emulate in my poem, um, as opposed to all the little little um, rumors and stories that are, are trickled away and, and have been lost there. There are these material things that are very precious and kept in a cabinet and have a lot of meaning. Um, there, there's this beautiful sense throughout the book that you're constantly finding the meaning, um, not just not just in things, but in in what um, I suppose people people eat and so forth. And um, um, uh, you know, and they, they keep you keep coming back to this idea of of, of food and so forth. Um, uh, you also have a poem understanding does that uh, play into this notion at all yeah um i think the the point of the poem understanding and that's the um the overture piece the piece that kind of prefaces the whole um book i think the point of it is that um it's about flipping your perspective you know this idea that you're always rooted in your perspective but you try to flip your perspective and find meaning in a way that um, someone else might find meaning. Um, and that's, I think, something that the speaker of this book, or there are, there are multiple speakers of the book, so the multiple speakers of the book have to kind of shift how they're looking at things and, and either empathize with someone else or be skeptical of someone else um, just as they're navigating life. Would you care to read Understanding? Sure. Okay, good. Standing under a bridge, you are blind. Eyelids sutured over iris by the smooth, starless underbelly of infrastructure that protects perception from possibility. Cages mischievous magpies of creativity in mud. An unknown lunar voice gleams like lamplight. Listen for the moon's monthly melody serenading sheen across a cobblestone road. Its beam will beckon your vision's transgression. Climb atop the bridge to yowl obods that jailbreak into an upside down verse of understanding. Beautiful poem. I, I noticed that every every poet when they read has their own style of reading, you know, and you have this you, you, the sense of punctuating, you know, each word and so forth, almost as if each word is, is something is an ingredient, I suppose, in the rest <laughs> of the, you know, it, it, it's, it's quite lovely. Um, the um, I, I was going to also I, I, next thing I wanted to ask you about was the um, um, you know, what have you learned along the way in terms of the journey of this book, in terms of, mm -hmm. of, of, of just what you've discovered generally, the things you've discovered about your own writing, uh, about, uh, you know, the family, the culture and everything like that, because yeah. you've really had to look at them intensely. Yeah. Um, I think I, I learned how, um, how much of an impact certain experiences have had on me. Um, not just letting things that happen pass by. And, um, you know, despite the fact that I've fictionalized, poeticized, translated my own experiences into 
like this work of fiction and poetry, um, I think that it remains integral to see how important things in everyday life are and how um, how many intimacies and connections there are and just little things that happen. Um, and then the other thing that I learned um, is that it is, or actually I learned this more in the editing phase, I think when, when you were helping me find the opera in it, and that is um, that it's sometimes more valuable to take things out. You know, you don't want to throw in everything but the kitchen sink um, into the book um, because it's important to have those silences. Do you have a favorite subject that you like to write about? Mm, a favorite subject? Um, I just like to write about little interactions between people and um, how those interactions relate to kind of the, the material realities or the daily rituals um, around us. Because uh, I, I, the title poem mm -hmm. seems to be about building bridges between people, building bridges between yourself and uh, and others, building bridges between things, so that everything seems to be linked and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, could you read the, the title poem to make a bridge? Yes. And this poem is dedicated for my, my nonnas. A letter like an overpass that touches both history and posterity. Asks we prick up ears. Learn patience in the present while waiting for the past to answer on paper. Poems are sideways viaducts that versify buried stories into arching alphabets, sentencing words into roads of imagined images. But while I craft mouthfuls of ink, you spell out another bridge. Precious plates of penne, heart-raving ravioli, all smothered with the sugo you schooled me to craft. Do you see how you guide my emerging hand? I never traversed an ocean, though I ache to translate your teachings. Bridge-making isn't a rigid refrain for traveling from A to B but an act of creation that ushers us across time and in between stories. An act of navigating, exploring the bearings that bind each to the other. Oh, I like, I love that poem. So, um, and it's a play on your name too. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. Um, what, in your mind, what, what makes the perfect book for you? If, if you mm. could, if you could, I mean, this is this is this is a lot the beautiful book, and this is it's, it's, it's you know. It, but if you could write like, I mean, even something more perfect. I mean, I you know, I haven't yeah. I couldn't imagine it right now. But <laughs> but if you could write something more perfect, you know, what what would it be? Yeah. What makes the perfect book? I think the perfect book prompts its reader to think more than the, what the book has said. You know, I think a good book will encourage more creative thinking that extends beyond the parameters of the book. Um, just because it, if it doesn't do that, it's kind of just like it's telling or talking to you, you know, and I could do that on a, on a regular day, you know, without binding it in a book. So, so the, the next thing you're working on, uh, will it be prose? Will it be poetry? Will it be, uh, a, mi a mixture both or I always tend to gravitate towards mixtures um I like writing little um <clears throat> little short prose pieces to kind of put between um the poems I'm not sure if they necessarily count as flash fiction I think they're probably more like really long prose poems um but right now I've been writing a lot on the suburbs a little bit um probably because I've been in the suburbs for, um, you know, this whole time. Um, and then I've got those other pieces on, on the back burner, you know, thinking about those ones that were cut from this book. Hmm. Well, I, 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 I wish you all the best with the, with the next one and Thank congratulations you. on this one. Um, it really is, it really is a, a hymn in many ways to, um, 
to the whole idea of, of, of moving from one place to another and of adjusting to some new place. But, um, you know, there, there, there's you know, two sections to the book. One was family and the other one is food. And it's almost as if the book ends up as a kind of celebration um, in many ways, which, which I, I, I really loved. So anyways, so, so congratulations on that. So, so we've you. been talking to Antonia Facciaponte, who is the author of To Make a Bridge, published by Black Moss Press. Is there a release date for it? Have they set a release date or no? Yes, it's coming out on April 6th um, in a few months. Okay. Congratulations. That's wonderful. Thank you. Yep. And I'll actually post some more information on how to find uh, books and uh, for book sale information at the end of this video. Uh, so if, if that's all for today, um, I'd like to thank you, Bruce, for hosting again. And thank you, Antoni Antonia, for joining us. Uh, it was beautiful listening to you read your poems. Thank you, thank you both for, for being here and, and setting all this up. Oh, you're welcome.